Gaina Tenho here, and this is Let's Watch with the Ann Arbor Film Festival. Every year, talented artists from all over the world aim to take part in our local film fest. Artists across all mediums utilize their skills to create films and performances to make their mark on this internationally renowned annual event. Joining me is artist Osman Khan. Welcome to the show. Great, uh, great to be here. Thanks, Dana. So why don't you tell me a little bit about your background and what, le what led you to the world of art? Yeah, so uh, interesting enough, uh, I started off as an engineer uh, and working very much in the dot-com um, arena, especially in the kind of early days, and seeing how technology sort of shifted our society. And my interest started to grow in being more critical of that kind of shift, which again, with criticality, right, it was both the positive and the negative. And I feel that's where the role of the artist and arts is to sort of reflect back on society. So then you um, were telling me before you got your MFA, was it was uh, MFA? Yeah, then yeah. I got my, right. So, so I, after, after working, kind of desiring this, I went to get an MFA from UCLA. And then where did you end up after that? Uh, then for a while in, in LA, uh, working on, with my art, and then uh, at some point got a teaching, uh, visiting artist, teaching position at Carnegie Mellon, and then now I'm at the University of Michigan. I'm actually the director of the MFA program here. At, our st at the STEM School of Art and Design. So do you find that your background in engineering has shaped the art that you create now? A little bit. I think it sort of shapes some of the topics I'm interested in, as we'll sort of talk about in the work uh, we'll, that was at the Ann Arbor Film Festival, but uh, as well as maybe sort of a, a, a certain approach might be, might be uh, something as well. Uh, I do work with technology. I'm comfortable with it. And I think of it as a medium, uh, so art can be expressed in various mediums so oh well when you talk about we don't need to discuss your work quite yet on drone which we'll be seeing in a little bit but what is some maybe you can tell us about some of the other work that you've created so uh kind of a uh, um maybe it was i think uh four years ago there was a show at mocad that dealt with the sort of um detroit and the kind of the domesticated kind of arena of detroit uh uh, were the three pieces. There was one which was a sort of simulated room that's sort of in a, this big tank that floods and drains for the two month duration. Mm -hmm. So we kind of see the effects of that, uh, which could be a kind of O2 global warming or other types of kind of metaphoric threats. There was a lighthouse that was made out of uh, glass fluorescent tubes. Again, talking about a certain fragility uh, of the kind of the domestic situation, as, especially when you look at it within the lens of Detroit. And another piece was that floated through a magnetic device that came crashing down every so often by if you made a phone call, which was called There Are Times I Lose Faith. So that's sort of, you know, where technology is used for metaphoric reasons as well as sort of talking about bigger issues that sort of I perceived when I came to Detroit. Do you, so all of your work is kind of based in like a performance reality, like you have to be in the room to a see A little bit, it? yeah. I mean, I, a lot of my work I call performative sculpture, even though I know that this is slightly different, but I do kind of, and maybe it does come from my kind of engineering background or, the, or our, our kind of use of interactive technologies that there is a kind of durational as well as an interactive a perform, you know, in a way we perform mm -hmm. technology in order to make it not just a kind of dead weight. Do you feel like uh, because you are so technology based that you always have to be on the cutting edge and doing whatever the latest technology is? Not anymore, I'm feeling pretty <laughs> <laughs> behind the times, uh, you know, especially with this, all this machine learning. Uh, I'd love to be, but at the same time, it's impossible to keep up. Mm -hmm. So there's different ways, ways I think the artists can still be critical mm -hmm. of this, uh, of, of talking about the latest without even necessarily fully knowing collaboration is one way, but, but there's other ways we can sort of, we use humor in a very good way. I think the artist has that ability as well. So when you're working with students at the un university, do you find that they kind of give you ideas and the way thing, the future is going? I hope so. I mean, uh, and I mean more their ideas. I, um, they are the future. They're the next zeitgeist. They are the art for the 21st century. So that's something I often push on them that, you know, you are creating it. And for them to question why they still kind of take tropes from the 20th century. Right? So if you're in the 21st, should we be rethinking what art could be, what it should be, how it's displayed, where, it, where it's displayed? So some of those, I mean, nothing's wrong with the white cube and the traditions, but we also have new, 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 new ideas coming out. But do you also feel like you have to look to the past when you're creating new? Because when you think about, um, let's say, like just Hollywood films, I feel like there's 
a crutch in a sense where like they're always going back to the past and they're like a lot of times they're not creating new but there's also something to be said about the past right so i think there's two one is sort of nostalgia one is to understand your history so i would never say never not know your historical background otherwise you're prone to repeat i know we talk about it in other ways but same with art you see art that repeats itself mm -hmm. The other is sort of a nostalgia, which is, uh, I think, in times of anxiety, society, and including in the arts, uh, is in just that moment where nostalgia sort of takes over because it's waiting, it's gestating on what the new could be. And I kind of do feel that's our current time right now. I, I would agree. Yeah. I mean, even just thinking about like Netflix and stuff like that, you're always hearing about like, oh, let's create, recreate this sitcom from the right. 90s right. or, right. you know. Right. Or films. I mean, <laughs> yeah. film is a good place where they're just repeating. Well, uh, and I think like even literally, not, not just the tropes, but actually remaking movies. That yeah. Were, and a lot yeah. of it, I think, um, even like growing up, you maybe didn't realize that something was a remake until right. you were <laughs> older. And you're right. like, now I know I've never even seen the original right, one, you know, right. so um, it's interesting the way that kind of ebbs and flows. So you think that maybe a few years from now we'll be actually seeing the future of what I think so. And of course, there's certain, you know, when it comes to narrative have, you know, are we repeating narratives always just because we're humans? That's probably true, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so in a big, big sense that that could be uh, for sure. But uh, I think we'll see we'll see something new technologies will develop. VR, for example, I'm sure that people are doing stuff, but at some point, new types of films will be made with VR or augmented reality that will change the way we even understand the cinematic. Uh, and I, I know someone like David Lynch hates that cinema is being watched on these small screens, yeah. which I, I agree, but, that, but maybe it's a new type of cinema that, that we, we, you know, will is different. Will be created for a small for, screen. Right, for, exactly. Yeah. Rather than picking, taking a big movie and putting it small, it's a new type of cinema that should be understood. And I think that's where the stage we're at. We haven't really pushed it to that. We're still kind of, you know, taking old tropes and fitting them into small boxes. Yeah, yeah. I, I would agree with that. And I'm kind of with you in the sense where, like, I don't want to watch a movie. I want to watch a movie on my big screen at home Absolutely. or in a theater, in a theater or something theater, like right, that. Right. I'm not going to watch it on a screen this big. I'm right. just not going right, to do it. Right. <laughs> but there's a kind of uh, a generation that I think is very used to it as yeah, well. Yeah, I uh, mean, even, um, like, um, I would say, like, kids that are maybe 15 years younger than me, like my nieces and nephews, they don't sit in the living room and watch TV on right. a TV. They're <laughs> sitting in the living room and watching shows on a tablet right. exactly. or on their phone. On their phone. Right, right, right. So there's a, there is that change. We also have to acknowledge. Do you think um, you see a lot of change with, like, now that people make a lot of videos on their phones and stuff? And are you, like, seeing it even for yourself maybe when you're creating that you're not necessarily using, like, the greatest equipment because you have equipment at your fingertips right, right all the time right right so i think that on one level the kind of democratization of technology kind of that every it's at everyone's fingertip is, is actually an amazing thing um, um, again everyone can be a, everyone a can direct be a filmmaker, a, filmmaker. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a good filmmaker is a different issue yeah but everyone can be a filmmaker i think what where i would really love to is one you know is that new voices get those things. So one of the things is because of media and kind of the uh, access to media, people again are just repeating what they're seeing. So those new voices that hopefully democratization of technology would allow, that needs to be pulled out, be it from uh, minority populations or marginal populations, mm -hmm. uh, unique voices, but also unique ways in how that um, technology can actually be used and then, then distribute it. So I think Netflix, you know, not Netflix, uh, YouTube and all these, they're wonderful on one level because they allow a different type of distribution. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I mean, even just like when you think about like certain kinds of social media where like maybe, I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm too old for Snapchat. I don't, right, right, I don't right, get it. Right. Um, but like kids are doing things in a certain way where it's like, okay, they're just creating these sorts of videos of themselves, right. but maybe that it will evolve into something that's got, has more artistry to Absolutely. it. Absolutely. And I'm sure there's new film festivals that kind of Snapchat film festival. So what is a, ten, what is it, 13 seconds? Something like that, yeah. Like what is a, what would be a cinematic event in 30 seconds? Yeah, like, which would actually be kind of cool to right, see. Right, right. Yeah. So, th so uh, again, it's not the same as a film. It's its own thing. And I think there will be, and that's where the artists and, and. They just have to come up, rise above rise it. Rise up and understand this is a technology and what can we do with it beyond the kind of, 
mundane that we know everyone does, which are sort of pranky or uh, yeah, know, like just which are fine. That that they must exist too, yeah. but but to elevate it to what we might call an art form. All right, great. Well, we heard a little bit about your background, so why don't we check out some of your work? Okay. Now that we know about Osmond's background in the arts, let's watch his video performance piece, Drone. Drone is a multi-channel video and multi-instrumentalist performance which centers on a play off of multiple readings on the word drone. The performance juxtaposes imagery mixed and edited from military, industrial, and hobbyist drone footage, as well as commissioned and live drone video feeds. In music, a drone is a harmonic or monophonic effect where a note or chord is continuously sounded. Finding expression in folk traditions such as Indian tambura, Australian didgeridoo, or the Scottish bagpipe, as well as contemporary interpretations such as the avant-garde sounds of Lamont Young, which mimic the constant hum and buzz of industrial and digital machines. Drone, when referring to unmanned aerial vehicles, have entered the consciousness of society as mechanisms of surveillance, telematic violence, and killing, while simultaneously transforming the way we visualize our surroundings through aerial cinematography. The word drone originates in reference to honeybees. In this context, a drone denotes a male bee whose sole function is to mate with a queen bee, dying quickly thereafter. As a performance, Drone immerses its audience using projections of multiple sources of content, generating an attentioned visual unfolding that is supported by the dramatic attack of the audio score. The performance uses three projection screens to immerse its audience. Video, light, and sound emit from a centralized stock while 11 musicians react to the projected video footage. Each section of the 35-minute performance aggregates drone imagery using themes such as hobbyist drone footage, the global city, nature, human conflict, and concludes with footage of military drone kills. visits the 1983 film Koyana Skatsi, staging a similarly powerful montage of visual, thematic imagery and sound to examine the dissonant realities of current aerial surveillance and visual technologies. We're back with Osman Khan, and he just showed us a shorter version of a longer piece of drone. Uh, can you kind of explain drone and where the idea of it came sure. from? Sure. Uh, so d actually, the idea sort of first came out uh, in this sort of publication that I put out called Drone Score, which basically, you know, was thinking through the, how the lexicon, the name, the word drone has shifted. Growing up, for me, drone was more allusions to kind of avant-garde music. You could think of uh, Indian classical music, right, where the drone sound of a kind of uh, uh, extended mm -hmm. note would be thought. And then in our kind of more contemporary, the drone started shifting first through kind of militaristic vehicles that were kind of um, killing people. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the, the publication itself was 
this play on the word drone score. So on the inside is a Lamont Young um, drone score, mm -hmm. which basically has a note, a perfect fifth note that's, and he says, to be held a long time. And now up on the outside, there's a tally marks of all the drone kills done by the US military in Pakistan, Yemen, and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So then to sort of, sort of, that was where the initial kind of idea came out for the publication. And then we thought it would be nice to sort of visualize this in a much more kind of expansive way. Mm -hmm. And so then drone, what the drone allowed was us to use 11 musicians playing a drone score that was composed by uh, a musician, James Cornish, and then video that sort of explored the drone sort of perspective. This included hobbyists, professionals, news agencies, uh, our own sort of shooting of drone uh, video as well as military kind of kills. So we sort of put that all together to create a sort of narrative arc and then juxtapose the two in a kind of live performance. So the live performance is what, like 30, so yeah, it was 30, like 30 minutes? minutes. Yeah. 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 Uh, do you, was this the first time that you were working with live music when you were creating one of your pieces? Because I feel like it's, there has to be a nice balance between yeah, it actually was, uh, even though I've worked with music myself, but uh, with live musicians. So also it was interesting because if you look at Lamont's score, uh, Lamont Young's score, which was again an influence, uh, how do we keep track? There's no notes, and same with James Cornish, he didn't really have notes, so everything was based on sort of timings um, and moods and things like that. So it was, it was fascinating. We had an opera singer as well, so um, I just think the kind of, bombast of all that sound was just gorgeous, especially juxtaposed with the different videos that were playing, which were, again, some were funny, some were very beautiful, mm -hmm. and some were harrowing. Did you find, uh, can you kind of tell me about the process of making this become a piece in itself, working with other artists to create this one? I mean, how long did it take to get oh, this together? Yeah, it took about maybe three to four months. Uh, there was also an architect involved, Peter Hallquist, who helped with sort of the set design. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, the first was once we got the idea to sort of put us together, next step for me was a lot of the video is from, like I said, different sources. So gathering all that video um, and then sort of trying to create a narrative arc uh, around it uh, um, and then figuring out the kind of architecture of the space that we wanted to create, including the stock that has all the projectors and lighting, working with the musicians. So there were moments we came together and there were moments where we had to separate and sort of surprise so the musicians went on on their own, came up with their own kind of ideas for what the score could be. And uh, a lot of it was discovered on the day of, yeah. <laughs> you know, which is, which is the beautiful part of kind of a, um, a kind of improv or performative uh, work like this. Was this like a one time only performance? No, this has now been performed three times. Uh, once at MOCAD, once at the Art Gallery of Windsor with a smaller group uh, and then at the Ann Arbor Film Festival last year. So how did you uh, get involved with the Ann Arbor Film Festival to be able to show this? Right, with so them? this is kind of unusual, but they started a, uh, a new series called Off the Screen, which wanted to explore kind of filmmaking or the cinematic beyond the normal kind of th theatrical space. Uh, so, so, so that's where we sort of got in, invited. And Do you, oh, you got invited, so it wasn't yeah. like you well, had Well, no, we, I think we applied. I okay, should, you I should applied, clarify. okay. I, I was yeah. wondering, I was actually kind of wondering how that worked, because you'd think that there would be people that would want to apply, but also if it's a newer thing where, you know, do they have to seek people out? Or, right, right. You know, just and to I'm, get the ball rolling. Right. No, I think there was a call out, uh, but of course, uh, you know, I, I, I know people at the film festival, so, mm -hmm. um, but uh, we did apply with our, you know, with our proposal. When I felt like watching it, you had very dramatic lighting. How important was it to kind of create that drama in the real life with the screens in the background? Right. So, I mean, one was to highlight the musicians themselves. Um, and so that play where uh, they also were at in, in sort of equal footing. So we've probably seen a lot of, and you can go back to kind of the olden days of cinema where you had the music's, musicians playing, but they were kind of hidden. Yeah. Right. So w we didn't want that quite a bit. We wanted the musicians to be forefronted. Uh, but there's a narrative arc and there's a dramatic arc, uh, almost kind of like a Koyanakatsi esque. Uh, even though that wasn't purposeful, it, it comes out in the in this film as well. Uh, and so just to replicate that, also to highlight uh, certain musicians when they're playing, and especially towards the end as the drama of the um, film increases. So, mm -hmm. so towards the end, there's all the drone kills. Uh, so that was very kind of again to create the dramaturgy 
of the space. Yeah. Can you explain uh, what maybe, because we're only seeing a shortened version of it today, uh, what people would experience when they're there watching the full version? Sure. So the kind of narrative arc starts with uh, liftoff and liftoff, uh, depending on which place we showed it off, either it started in Detroit or Ann Arbor, sort of this liftoff of these kind of hobbyist drones, and then it expands kind of to look at the world. So it goes into Detroit and then the gra greater city. So we're looking at monuments and then beautiful mountains and you know just the gorgeousness animals running in Africa so you just kind of see the world but in a very kind of almost I would almost say boring in the, at some point but very beautiful kind of shots right mm -hmm. and now this technology allows that again in the hands of everybody or in the past it was helicopter shots or really really expensive shots right to do these type of yeah I mean they have those drones that are like this big they're that's like right 40 and bucks right you know, they're, like almost, anyone they're doing can almost have 4k yeah. you know uh, and then at one moment, sort of halfway, things switch. So the drones start crashing. And then we have sort of protests being documented. And then sort of cities in ruin. And so there's this kind of secondary arc, which, which again, what this, this technology allows, allows us kind of a different type of surveillance, um, surveillance to the state or by the state. And then it sort of ends with sort of how the kind of the militaristic drone. So there's, unfortunately, I mean, the sh shots of being, of, you know, individuals being killed yeah um, and so, so there's like I said there's this narrative arc which again flips it because at one point you're just like oh so beautiful yeah, such so, nice, so lovely yeah. you know <laughs> I love those mountains look at those lions and then uh, and then sort of switches to understand again that kind of fullness of the word drone and uh, where it's taken us right so it has this kind of, kind of I think just the kind of um, compl complexness of this word now from the musical to the kind of mm -hmm. um, other uses it has now. Yeah. So when you uh, have this, these uh, performances going on, do you are you in the audience? Or are you behind uh, the scenes? No. So I'm actually. Uh, so the so the film uh, we've tried it with live video, and that didn't work as well. So the video is far more canned. But the lighting, I'm working on the lighting. Okay. Uh, and of course, it's sort of making sure everything's running on on this side. Um, at the, when the performance, it's really the musicians who are more in the forefront. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think I, yeah. Uh, so I'm working some of the kind of tech in the back just to make sure everything's running. So what are some of the reactions you get from the audience, uh, maybe during it that you hear, or if you can, I don't know. Could you? Yeah, I mean, there's uh, there's certain scenes which are kind of humorous. Um, it's usually when that twist happens mm -hmm. when you start seeing the drones crashing. You kind of hear people kind of react, and then towards the end when it gets to the kind of more kind of the horror of the drone. Uh, you can, not that people gasp, but you can, there's a silence. You can feel you the can change. You can feel this, the change. Yeah. There's a sort of, sort of humbled silence of, of, of realizing what they're looking at. Um, yeah. So after it's all said and done and you get, you know, maybe your friend's family, they talk to you about it, uh, what are they saying when they so when a lot of them, I think, experienced it? Yeah, I think a lot of it's just that twist. Because, yeah. you know, for so long it's sort of this beautiful footage, which no one, I mean, everyone kind of acknowledges, but uh, at least from a lot of friends who are maybe more critical, they're like, oh, I was getting bored. You know, it's, it's, yeah, it's, there's it's nothing to it. There's nothing know? too much. Yeah. It's too candy, right? It's too yeah. syrupy. So they're, they were very kind of, I think the twist helps them kind of make sense. Otherwise, it would be just a kind of National Geographic-esque uh, thing. So that twist, I think it came at, at a good point. So, when you're surprise, yeah. obtaining the drone footage, is it, or like, how do you get this footage? So a lot of it is, again, people posting it uh, um, for public consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the military ones, a lot of them are more public, or there are certain sites that kind of are a little, a lot, or they're harder to maybe reach by the public, but nothing too black ops here. Uh, yeah, yeah. So th this is all public and public. And video. then when you're kind of creating it, what kind of what sort of pieces were you shooting yourself, or you felt like you uh, more of the local ones? Yeah, uh, uh, just to start with that kind of local. Lo kind yeah, of to be like a, we're in we're Ann Arbor, Arbor or right. Detroit, right. and, and so just to set the scene. Set the scenes, yeah. So. And did you have any challenges um, to kind of editing that piece as a whole, the the video in the back? It was. I mean, one we were doing a three-channel video, mm -hmm. so just the kind of scale of it, all primarily in HD. Uh, um, so that was one, just and, and then timing it. Uh, so each one had to play off the three screens. Sometimes they're showing the same video spread across three. Sometimes there's a kind of juxtaposition. Uh, just the amount of footage 
that's probably the hardest, as any editor will tell you, probably uh, just whittling, you know, whatever hundreds of out. Yeah, hundreds. well, because yeah, at some point it's like, man, this is great. I want that's to right. this, yeah. but I can't. And that's exactly like, yeah. oh, that's not, oh my god, oh my god, and. It's and almost as like a lot of times as an editor, you need that extra set of eyes, just someone else to come in and look at it and be like, you know, you don't need that. Right, That's right. That's not necessary. Right. Uh, did you find like some of the images you were like, I just have to use, like I need this? Yeah, image. no, there were some. I mean, again, some beautiful like camera work going through like a mountain hole and things. So there were some things like that where were just like you're like, no, this is good. Also, just in sequencing. So we had a beautiful scene of some uh, folks taking not just one but multiple shots of fireworks where the drones are kind of inside it mm -hmm. and juxtaposing that with uh, lightning. And I'm not forgetting if the lightning came first, but just this sort of beautiful where there's a spark and then it changes to the next scene. So there was a lot of those as well where how can you make seamless sort of transitions from different kind of stages. So what do you think is next for you? Uh, well, we'll see where drones score. I mean, there's a whole different film idea. I am actually looking into maybe potentially a VR film mm -hmm. that I've been thinking about uh, with a kind of mechanical device, kind of one of these hobby horses that, that you might be riding while watching this film. Yeah. So kind of again moving into both performative but if we shift cinema and this goes back to maybe Centorama and all these old type of uh, ideas of the kind of full body experience of what film could be. Yeah. So thinking about that maybe in a, in, so that, that's something I'm kind of curious and we'll be playing with. Well, we're just about out of time, but if you could tell people why they should check out the Ann Arbor Film Festival, either to watch films, go see performances off the screen, whatever. So, you know, the, the Ann Arbor Film Festival, I'm, I'm probably not right about the dates, it's one of the <laughs> oldest, uh, cutting edge, willing to go where no one else goes, film festivals out there. Um, the, it's just had a, has a great tradition of really promoting experimental films, experimental directors and filmmakers, and just has a kind of the, 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 the right vibe of being, you know, a place to exchange ideas. All right, well, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you, Dana. For more on this and other CTN series online, visit a2gov.org slash watchctn. I'm Dana Denhoff for Let's Watch with the Ann Arbor Film Festival.